uh, a, a bit of an introduction and Paul will uh, have make some comments and then uh, I may uh, give some very brief commentary but we want to have plenty of time here for discussion uh, um, with you here in the audience um, and then uh, without further ado um, Alex please um, start your presentation thank you Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, we're outside term time. We expect people to have left Oxford, and yet you're here. So I think that says something about how important this topic is. Um, also, in particular, thank you to Stefan. In a way, I feel a little bit apologetic that you've got an all-middle-aged male panel talking about an issue that largely affects women from the global south, or significantly at least. But I can't apologize too much, because Stefan is one of the few people in Oxford who I think can really understand and engage with the relationship between refugees and development from a policy and academic perspective. So thank you, Steph, for joining us. This is a book that is not intended to be primarily an academic book. It's something we've produced to engage with the general public and policymakers in an attempt to provide a starting point for a rethink of the global refugee regime, to lay out a debate that, if you like, might presage a refugee regime 2.0, a rethink against the backdrop of a system that is demonstrably failing. This is the first time that Paul and I have presented the book together. It's not even out yet. But the book follows a format with three parts. It begins with the crisis, it moves to the rethink, and finally it has a brief section at the end which is called Back to the Future, where we look at had some of our ideas been in place prior to the Syria crisis, how might things have been different? Partly reflecting that, we're going to split the material where I'll say quite a lot about the crisis, how we can think about the problem in the world that has been described as a crisis, and Paul will lay out a number of the elements, although not all, of the rethink, and then we'll open up to discussion, and we really want to debate because we don't think we have all of the answers, but we hope we have a starting point. But I want to begin with the backstory. How is it that we came to write this book? Why is it that... Um, a professor of economics and public policy in the Blavatnik School and a professor of forced migration in the Department of International Development came together. Well, rewind two years, and it was prior to the kickoff of what became known as the European refugee crisis. And Paul received an invitation from a think tank in Jordan, connected to the Jordanian royal family. And Jordan was a country overwhelmed by hosting huge numbers of Syrian refugees. At that time, 600,000 according to the official statistics, but even more according to the Jordanian government. A huge proportion relative to its overall population. It felt a lot of pressure in terms of development and security. And so Paul got in touch with me at the Refugee Studies Center, saying he'd had that approach and wanted to engage with that think tank. Could he brainstorm some initial ideas about how development and indeed economics could relate to the refugee challenge? We traveled together in April 2015 to Jordan, visited Amman and the Zatari refugee camp, home to 83,000 Syrians. And while we were there exploring ideas for how development could contribute to creating jobs for Syrian refugees in a context where they were denied the right to work, where they didn't have access to work permits and were forced to work in the informal economy, if at all. During a brief break, one of our guides decided to show us a special economic zone just 15 minutes from the Zatari refugee camp. It was initially just to kill time. It was just downtime. The Jordanian government had spent about £100 million connecting it to the electricity grid and the road network, but it lacked labour and it lacked inward investment. But they hadn't connected that to the potential that lay just 15 minutes away. The fact that 83,000 refugees were sitting largely idle, in many cases wanting to work, but being denied the right to work. So we put two and two together and probably came up with five. And we pitched to a series of NGOs, to the royal family, and to the government the idea that perhaps there was a way, in a very constrained environment, to empower refugees, to make use of their skills, their talents, their aspirations, and enable them to work in that politically restricted environment. Perhaps, indeed, we could reach outwards and engage the European Union with trade concessions. Perhaps we could engage development actors to build infrastructure. And perhaps it could be win-win for refugees, for the host society, and for the economy of Syria once the conflict came to an end. That was April 2015. 
Of course, you'll be aware that something else, meanwhile, was happening in April 2015. It was also what became the start of the European refugee crisis. That month, some 700 people crossing the Mediterranean to reach Lampedusa lost their lives. And media frenzy focused on refugees to an unprecedented level. It became known as the migrant crisis in the media. It was predominantly a refugee crisis. During 2015, around a million asylum seekers came to Europe. Now, we need a degree of perspective. A million asylum seekers against the backdrop of 28 EU member states should have been manageable. But the response was a disaster. What made the refugee crisis a crisis was not numbers per se, but the mismanagement. It wasn't a crisis of numbers, but a crisis of politics. I think there are three things that made that crisis different from the past, and it wasn't simply the numbers. The first thing that distinguished it was fragility, the second mobility, and the third toxicity. In terms of fragility, what today drives movement across borders is not persecution, it's not authoritarian regimes persecuting individuals, although that's still present in part. It's fragile states. Over 50% of the world's refugees come from Syria, Somalia, and Afghanistan. It's fragility that's driving those movements and makes them different from the past. The second thing that's different is mobility. Technology plus aspiration means that more people can move transcontinentally, can come from the Middle East or Africa to Europe in ways that weren't present in the past. And the third thing that's different that really made this a crisis was the post 9-11 context of the toxicity of immigration and indeed Islam in Europe and elsewhere. Against that backdrop, the European refugee crisis was a test case for how our systems would or would not be adapted to suit the migration challenges of the 21st century. And our policies demonstrably failed. During the course of the last two and a bit years, 9,000 people have died trying to reach Europe. Human rights standards across Europe have collapsed amidst deterrent policies. And Europe's policies have been muddled from start to finish. In Germany, attempting to provide leadership, Angela Merkel went from via scharf and das, an initial open door policy in August 2015, to by March 2016, undergoing a complete U-turn to engaging in a partnership with Turkey, handing over 6 billion euros and closing the Balkans route and closing the Aegean. Which, irrespective of which one of those policies you regard to be right, the U-turn shows the muddled thinking and the collective action failure. Indeed, the legacy of that failure is multifaceted. Not only were there human consequences, but amid campaign slogans like breaking point um, and take back control, Brexit used the migrant crisis as its main campaign tool. The common European asylum system lay in tatters and the European project itself was called into question. So with that and our prior work in Jordan, Paul and I decided that there was a gap that there were few people trying to provide a vision. And so we at least wanted to attempt to write up what our vision would be as that starting point. So what I want to do in setting up an understanding of the crisis is focus just briefly on three areas. Firstly, to ask the question, why is our system broken? What is the problem? Secondly, what's the purpose of refuge? What's it actually for? If we get back to basics and we remind ourselves what a good refugee system should be providing, what functions should it have? And thirdly, in broad terms, what are the elements of the argument and the main parts of a solution that we want to put forward? In terms of a broken system, it's worth reminding ourselves where most refugees in the world are. They're not in Europe. They're not in North America. They're not in developed parts of the world. The absolute numbers of refugees are small, just over 20 million international refugees, although there are around 60 million displaced, most in their own countries. The challenge is not of absolute numbers, it's of geographical concentration. 90% of the world's refugees are in developing regions of the world. And 60% of refugees are in just 10 host countries. Countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Uganda, Kenya, Iran, Pakistan, Thailand, Chad, Ethiopia. That's the part of the world where the real refugee challenge lies. And while we focused on the crisis in Europe, a parallel tragedy is unfolding in those host states. For every one pound of public money 
we spend on an asylum seeker in Europe, we spend less than a penny on refugees in those host countries. That's not necessarily an argument that we're misallocating the one pound, but it's certainly an argument that we're not allocating enough to those host countries. And yet the default response to refugees in those countries continues to be refugee camps. That's the rollout solution of the humanitarian system. To open up camps designed for the initial emergency phase to provide food, clothing and shelter. That's right in the emergency phase. The problem is it endures year after year, such that the average stay in a camp is now nearly two decades. Indeed, once a refugee has been in exile for five years, their average length of stay, according to the UN Refugee Agency, is 26 years. People are being born into, growing up in, and becoming adults in camps. Invariably, they're denied the right to work and denied freedom of movement. And so faced with that, refugees have an impossible choice. They can stay in those camps, firstly. Secondly, they can move on to urban areas. But in urban areas, they rarely have the right to work. They have to work in the informal sector, and many face destitution. And that leaves the only option as a third choice of embarking on perilous journeys with smugglers. That has to be a false choice in the 21st century, and there have to be other ways of navigating it. But the international institutional architecture is failing to provide alternative solutions. It's stuck in a time warp and was built for a very different era in the aftermath of the Second World War. That institutional architecture comprises, from a European perspective, three elements. The 1951 Refugee Convention that defines who is a refugee and the rights that refugees are entitled to. Secondly, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR. And thirdly, the common European asylum system. All are failing to be fit for purpose to the challenge we see today. The UN Refugee Convention was made for a an era in which persecution was the primary driver of movement. Against the backdrop of fragility now being the underlying cause of movement, it misses out people who are in need of protection, and it comes up with inconsistent and idiosyncratic decision-making about who gets refugee status. For instance, if you're an Eritrean, you have about a 24% chance of getting refugee status in France, but if you go to Sweden, you have about an 100% chance. For much of the 1990s, Germany refused to recognize Somalis as refugees because there was no state to persecute them in court decisions. And so courts are forced to shoehorn contemporary circumstances into the language of the 1950s. It's not necessarily that we're saying we should throw that convention out, but it's not providing all the answers. Meanwhile, the UN Refugee Agency is very good at certain things. It's very good at giving legal advice to governments, and it's very good at providing care and maintenance in camps. But these are not the skills that are needed for a UN refugee agency in the 21st century. The skills that are needed are political leadership, identifying mutual gain between governments, and putting a vision on the table. And secondly, development skills to provide jobs and autonomy. And the common European asylum system based on the Dublin system that allocates responsibility to the country that asylum seekers first arrive in, was built for small numbers, not the mass influx we've seen. So stepping back from that failure, secondly, what should be the purpose of refuge? One of the challenges we face today is that refuge has become mixed up in a broader toxic debate about immigration and globalization. And today, in the aftermath of Brexit, with the rise of populist nationalism, there's been a very strong recognition that we have to take democracy with us. We have to reconcile it with other aspects of globalization. But refuge, correctly thought of, doesn't have to be part of that. It's not about migration per se. Refugees don't have an absolute right to migrate. They have a contingent right to migrate insofar as it's necessary to access the protection and safe havens they need. Of course, refugees moved on from Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey in 2015. There was inadequate safe haven, inadequate protection, and inadequate assistance in those countries. But correctly thought of, we should be doing better to provide safe haven to the majority where they are. In Europe, refuge has come to signal fear. In Turkey and Kenya, it's come, some, come to signal money. We need to put refuge back in its place and recognize what it's for and what tasks comprise refuge. We suggest there are three manageable tasks. Firstly, a duty of rescue. We have to provide people with safety, food, shelter, clothing, 
as happens in camps. That's right for the emergency phase, phase and it's right for the duration in which there's a, a risk. But secondly, and more importantly, the part that's neglected is autonomy. We have to restore refugees' lives to normality as quickly as possible by giving them freedoms, the opportunity to use and maintain and sustain their skills, and we're failing to do that. And the third task is a route out of limbo. It may be reasonable to expect refugees to wait for three or maybe even five years, but ten years in limbo is absolutely unjustifiable. So it should be that there's a cutoff beyond which we resettle people. But at the moment, the purpose of resettlement is being lost. It's used by governments to make them feel better rather than to coherently and strategically add up to something. So the vision that we put forward in the book is one grounded in development, one where we recognize where most refugees are. But at the moment, they lack jobs, they lack autonomy, they lack an enabling environment. So the question is, how can we begin to build that? There are past precedents of success that can guide us. Self-reliance has offered sustainable opportunities at scale for refugees in the past, but those past examples and precedents have been lost. In Central America in the 1990s, for example, Mexico integrated relatively large numbers of Guatemalan refugees after the Cold War. It did so with significant development assistance from the European community in a way that not only benefited refugees, but contributed to the development of the Yucatan Peninsula. In Uganda, we in Oxford have done a study at the Refugee Studies Centre looking at one of the very few countries that does give refugees the right to work and freedom of movement. We've shown that in Uganda, refugees can contribute to the host economy and help themselves and their community if they're given basic socioeconomic freedoms. And that recognition is, in a way, the starting point that opens up new avenues for how we think about globalisation as an opportunity, development as an opportunity, and how we can conceive of ways in which we don't necessarily replicate that Uganda model, but look in a context-specific way at the other challenging parts of the world. And I think that's where Paul's going to pick up the story. Great, Alex, I won't be so articulate, but um, let me pick up from your point that um, what really matters to refugees, what is our duty of, ref of, of rescue, um, it's to, to restore normality, and the most fundamental feature of normality is a degree of autonomy. Uh, um, and uh, in unmodeling uh, refugees from migrants, we should remember that you know, the refugees are sort of by definition people who chose to stay at home. Um, why have they left their country? Because their homes became unlivable. <coughs> Disorder took over or famine took over or something like that and so they, they had to abandon their homes. They're, they're displaced. And I'll return in the end to back to displacement as actually the fundamental concept here. The refugees are those displaced, the minority of the displaced, the substantial minority who managed to stumble over the nearest border. Um, there's a good reason why most refugees don't roam very far. Um, if you're seeking safe haven with your family, um, you don't want to, your objective is not let's migrate to California, it's let's find somewhere that's close. Uh, a safe, as, safe haven as close as possible. Um, hopefully, one that's close so that we can eventually go home. Uh, a lot of refugees, when they become refugees, are hopeful that return will, will soon be feasible. Um, and as Alex says, all too often it isn't. And I'll close with that point. So, re-establishing autonomy is sort of fundamental to our duty of rescue. And that's what the present system isn't doing is still stuck in the temporary food, temporary shelter mode, except the food and shelter's there for years and years and years. It inadvertently infantilizes refugees. They're stripped of all autonomy. Um, and uh, Alex was very familiar with refugee camps. I wasn't. But that was what most deeply shocked me in talking to refugee families in these camps, that they'd been shredded of the self-respect of autonomy. Um, and so what's the basis of autonomy? It's the ability to earn a living. Right? And so 
the basis of our duty of rescue is to enable people to earn a living. It means a job. Right? Um, now, um, most refugees, that is indeed their priority because most refugees, both in Syria and the world as a whole, ignore the whole UN um, system of uh, free food, free shelter. Despite not being allowed to work, they go to towns in search of work. And as Alex has said, because they're not allowed to work, they are at the bottom of that ladder and it's pretty grim. So our duty of rescue is first and foremost to bring better work to the people who are trying to restore autonomy, better than the grim conditions of illegality. Um, now, how to do that, given that um, there's a very obvious reason why these ten haven countries who are host to, to most refugees don't want to allow refugees to work. They're all desperately poor countries, countries of emigration themselves. I think it's true that none of them are actually signatories to this convention. So it's supposed to be a global convention, but it doesn't apply to most of the Haven countries. You know. um, the, um, that's not to say the convention is irrelevant, but it just misses the real core of the, of the mass problem. Um, so the challenge brings jobs to refugees in havens where governments for very obvious reasons, don't want refugees to work because they don't want them competing for the scarce jobs with their own citizens. Right? They have a responsibility to their own citizens. And their own citizens are saying we don't have to compete with a load of desperate people. So, what's the duty of rescue? It's, yes, it's solidarity. It's an international obligation. My goodness, in the Syrian refugee crisis, the regional, the neighbours really stepped up to the plate. They provided safe haven en masse to refugees, millions of them. Right? Our responsibility in Europe is, of course, to show solidarity. And that also means take some people, provide safe haven ourselves, but our, as well as solidarity, solidarity has to be tempered by the head and the head says, comparative advantage. Do what you're best at. The poor regional neighbours are best at providing the physical space for safe haven. We, the distant rich countries, are best at providing the money and the jobs that these havens need. And although a lot of refugees appeared to come to Europe. Let me point out that the large majority of Syrian refugees stayed in the havens, right? stayed in the regional havens. They didn't come. Right? The, select, the, the move to the havens was actually very selective. Um, the, uh, um, it was selective both by gender, it was mainly male, um, it was selective by age, but above all, it was selected by education. The move out of Syria was completely non-selective. From the demographics of the refugees, they're just a random replica of the Syrian population, because fear can strike anywhere. But the move to Europe was highly selective. A small minority, less than 5% of the Syrian population is in Europe. But we estimate that something between a third and a half of all the Syrians with university or education are in Europe. Right? Inadvertently, we've drained Syria of the very people who will be most needed to rebuild Syria. Right? We didn't mean to do that. It wasn't a, a viciously meant policy of we'll take the best. It was just inadvertent, but it was an example of what we mean by the headless heart. And the problem is too serious for the headless heart. You know, Europe started with the heartless head for four years, neglecting 
lurched for three months to the headless heart and is now back with heartlessness, unfortunately. So, what does a head heart policy look like? It means providing the money for the havens and bringing jobs to the havens. What Alex and I put to the Jordanian government was how about viewing refugees not as a liability but as an opportunity? There you are, you're a middle income country stuck in the middle income trap. To get out of it, you desperately need the world's big firms. And the big firms are not coming to you for various reasons. <coughs> but with that refugee labor force and with the attention of the world, you could actually get the international community to bring the refugee, to bring the big firms to Jordan. And that started to happen. We went to the World Bank. The, we said to the World Bank, what, what are you doing in Jordan? They said, nothing. We're not allowed to. It's an upper middle income country. Our rules say no activity in upper middle income countries. We said, there's a million refugees there, damn it. They're not upper middle income, they're desperate. Yeah. Oh, refugees, nothing to do with us. That's a humanitarian issue. Go ask UNHCR. Yeah. UNHCR is not equipped to do jobs. It's full of lawyers and anthropologists, right, as, as Alex said. Right? It's the wrong agency for the problem. Right? You either change this staff of UNHCR, change its mandate, or get other agencies involved. The fast track thing is get other agencies involved. So we just suggested, why don't you ask the board of the World Bank whether it thinks this will be a sensible thing to do? So to its credit, the Middle East region of the World Bank put together a project saying, what about a loan, soft money loan, to Jordan to finance jobs in refugee camps Job, sorry, jobs in industrial zones near refugee camps that will then, um, those jobs will be partly for refugees and partly for Jordanians. New jobs coming in. Uh, World Bank tried that with its board. Um, we got the feedback. Every delegate, usually, there's a, very few delegates speak and they come up with complaints. In this case, every delegate wanted to speak and they we're saying, this is a great idea. Why have, not, why have we not been doing this before? 60 years, and this was the first refugee loan. Right? So at last, they built the world's main economic agencies in business. Then we went to the European Commission and said, um, you know, do you realize that you've got trade barriers against goods made in Jordan? There's no chance of getting firms to go to Jordan whilst you're imposing trade barriers on any goods made in them. And so, European Commission thought, yeah, that's, that's not a good idea. Let's change the rules. So they've given Jordan 10 years free market access. Right? Now, this started to shape up as a package that the Jordanian government was interested in. So they said, yeah, we'll do thousands and thousands. I mean, they've been talking 200,000 work permits for Syrian refugees in Jordan as long as the jobs come in. So now the action is going to firms try and get firms to come in. For example, in Britain, um, the business secretary herded up a load of chief executives, put them on a plane and flew them to Jordan and said, go look, see, go and find opportunities. Asda, the huge supermarket chain, discovered it could source a lot of its supplies in Jordan, generating jobs which will be shared between refugees and Jordanian citizens. That's the win-win. Got to shut up soon, but one little tweak on that is um, conflicts eventually end. They don't end soon enough, but when they end, the job is then um, post-conflict recovery. And uh, we can, I was going to say kill two birds with one stone here, but killing is probably not the right image, but um, uh, we can, by doing this, we can incubate the post-conflict recovery before the conflict has ended. As we bring in firms that employ Syrian refugees, they run businesses which use Syrian refugees, and then when the conflict's over, those refugees will want to go back to Syria, and the firm can set up an operation in Syria with those workers. And so you're building the 
the economic infrastructure for a post-conflict recovery, the firms that employ people, even before the conflict's over. Um, let, me, um, let me turn finally to, um, back to, to this issue of displacement, which I think both Alex and I see as the fundamental phenomenon. And there's a desperate statistic in refuge, which is that uh, the number of displaced people is at a post-1945 all-time high. You know? I mean, this is shocking if you think about it. We've had 60 years of the most unprecedented global economic development in the history of humanity. And yet, alongside all that growth and development, displacement is at an all-time peak. Um, so something's going very seriously wrong. And, uh, and this is what I think is, is, is going, going desperately wrong, is that, um, as Alex said, the, the heart of it is fragility. There are a lot of states prone to fragility, and we do very little about that fragility. We've really not had a good way of addressing fragility at all for the last decades. That's why it's still there. And then every now and then, a few of the countries prone to fragility, their number comes up and they collapse. Not many at any one time, but they collapse. And even if they crawl out of the collapse, all they do is return to fragility. Very few countries are escaping that fragility. And so what we're seeing is a sort of ratchet. Each time a country collapses, it generates a load of uh, displaced people, and then that country, even if it gets back to peace, it never gets back to the sort of development that would actually enable people to return safely. And so the, the, the stock of the displaced accumulates like a ratchet. If that's the problem we want to tackle, we need to do three things. The first, which is the main focus of refuge, our book, is whilst people are displaced, we better look after them. And that means autonomy, a job. The second thing is um, we better try and um, stop the flow into displacement by addressing that pool of fragile states, um, trying to reduce proneness to, uh, to, to, to implosion. Um, and I'm very proud that uh, uh, the Blavatnik school, Blavatnik school, together with the London School of Economics, has just established last week a new commission on state fragility, um, uh, chaired jointly by David Cameron, Donald Kabaruka, um, which will be working in the next year to try and come up with policies to make a better job of reducing fragility, and that will staunch the flow into displacement. But that's a long haul. And then finally, um, uh, the other flow, that um, uh, the, the recovery from uh, conflict, and that's the incubation strategy. We must make a better job of post-conflict economic recovery. So with that, uh, let, me, let me shut up and come and join you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> allow me to use um, this opportunity to, to give you a few reflections on some of the things in the book, but um, also from the point of view of um, how these thoughts have, um, yeah. <laughs> have influenced uh, public policy. Actually, this is not just a pamphlet that maybe now maybe end up being read somewhere in Whitehall and maybe in five years maybe someone may think they want to do something. I mean, the, right, the, the book has written up is actually, and the ideas within it, have already quite strongly influenced and helped to consolidate thinking in public policy circles, actually contributing to a new narrative. Um, and in particular, um, I have to declare an interest in last, in, in recent times, I have been and I still am the Chief Economist of the Department for International Development in the UK. Um, and 
these ideas have definitely um, been very influential in trying to work with the international community to get some of these better responses going. And allow me to, just as Alex was dating some of the thinking and how it came to summer April 2015, um, allow me to actually reflect a little bit of how the, the link with policy started coming faster. Of course, it's in various routes, but I'll tell in my own department. And what it did happen, I actually know it very well, still remember very well, I think, in fact, I was sitting on a little table um, on my holiday in Spain while all in August 2015, where a lot of things were happening, and I started getting urgent requests from London and saying, you know, do you have any ideas? Is there anything we can do? And look, UK in that moment was making a very particular public policy uh, choice that, you know, maybe at that moment for most people looked extremely strange and abhorrent, while for others, and in fact Paul has articulated it, if you start reflecting on it, has actually more... Um, more thinking potentially behind it, at least if you be, want to look at it in a longer perspective. And uh, I do remember getting the link to, and I think it was uh, Foreign Affairs or something, the paper that came at uh, that moment. And, uh, you know, um, as someone who has known Paul for uh, an extremely long time, um, they'll pick up, oh, Paul has written something, let's have a quick look at it. And I remember starting to think, on, in line with some other things that we started to see, of how this actually could work. Um, and then, in the subsequent months, uh, you know, got on a plane to Jordan and started talking, and in fact, more or less mirrored the visit that they did, together with people that I know exactly the person who did lead them to the industrial park, because the man was extremely well prepared, because he had already a full slide back for actually with a lot of the details of how the industrial park would actually serve the refugees. This person had a particular interest, he wanted the industrial park to work. But at the same time, he could see this is really a, a great opportunity. And then we ended up in a strange situation in November 2015, where I ended up representing the UK government and Paul uh, advising the Jordanian government, working out some of the practical aspects from what later on became the Jordan Compact, uh, which was then launched in the Syria conference uh, in uh, February 2016 which indeed tried to put together some of the ideas that Alex and Paul had and others uh, added to, to actually try to put this into practice. But let me talk down the rest of the story. You know, how do you try to then put it in a public policy environment is more into practice? What other kind of problems, what other kind of things you hit before we can actually get to that result? As I said, you know, the UK policy choice was what it was, but the underlying idea that um, an awful lot of very poor people who could definitely not afford to come to Europe. They had neither the education nor the money, you know, crosses into Europe did cost several thousands of dollars that most of the people that were trapped in Lebanon and Jordan just could never afford. Um, they also, as Paul said, in a lot of service we had, had no intention to want to go much further. They wanted to be able to, be able to go back in due course to their, their, their countries. I should give a bit of credit to Diffit and Justin Greening already earlier. They had understood that just giving you know, shelter and uh, food is clearly not something that, that keeps human dignity. And indeed, by then already, um, UK had spent and been leading, uh, together with some other donors, spending an awful lot of money um, on trying to at least get the children into education. So at least the future generation doesn't have to be lost in the same way in terms of the opportunities they could get. But the missing piece was definitely on the economic side. On the opportunity side, what you do with all these adults that are there, as we now know, and of course we know it from all kind of these kinds of settlements, many traumatized and definitely with lots of psychological damage, um, that actually are, are dispirited and then don't see a future, but actually would crave for autonomy and, ab and ability to actually live a life and to be to a dignified life that would include work and be able to care for their families. So that piece coming together was then very, very important. And Paul has eloquently described it of some of the aspects that were within it. But to putting these things in practice is extremely hard. 
the UN system, as Paul alluded to, uh, too many lawyers and anthropologists, I would add too many public health people as well, but actually definitely no economists. I think they had two economists in the whole organization. Um, they are not equipped to start thinking about how do you help to try to create um, a people, uh, people, opportunities for people. And just within a system where they have the mandate to deal with the refugees, are they the ones that actually can start helping you think through how to actually help with the economic opportunities? And the system is also not designed to do something that's really important when we start working on economic things. You can't just simply take in isolation the refugee population. They are, they are living within an economy. They are based within an economy and they have to interact with people in that economy. And therefore, you have to take into account what is happening to the host communities. You know, if you try to create op economic opportunities, people may think, or indeed it may well happen, that actually they may crowd out the opportunities for the local population in that respect. So that's a very, an, an issue that needs to be dealt with. And again, UN organizations, by only focusing on the refugee population, have very little room to do this. But then the difficulty, while it is so obvious that surely we should try to use our resources to try to create the opportunities so that these economies start growing again, so that it's not a zero-sum game of one person gets a job, now the refugee, at the expense of other people, but actually that new opportunities get created, it's of course extremely hard. It's proved in recent times, we, even though work permits can be given, in Jordan, 38,000 people uh, managed to get a job, but there's actually opportunities for 50,000 people. And indeed, there is a struggle and a real question of how do we manage to match people to opportunities in the right way. Because these people, as I said, they are traumatized. They have had, they, they come from, in, uh, definitely in Jordan, many come from rural settings. Are we going to be able to get jobs and we can actually match them into this? Um, of course, it is in the context of an economic recession. This is not a dynamic economy. Jordan and Lebanon are at the moment facing extremely low growth. So it is actually very hard to even get other investors to say, look, we'll give you incentives to come and invest. But actually saying, but is this good economy to invest in at the moment? And it's one of these things that also have the consequence of the conflict that actually the neighboring countries become fragile and their growth is affected. And again, things that we need to try to work on. Things we can do, as Paul described, is that uh, lots of people worked very, very hard to lobby the EU to get these trade preferences. But it, even though it was obvious um, to us uh, when the compact was agreed in November, or at least the draft was agreed, it took actually until well into the summer before the EU managed to actually get these trade preferences changed. Well, of course, this is a situation of urgency. These systems work very slow, and it takes a long time to be able to convince people to do this. And then finally, of the kind of why it just doesn't happen, you're working in a particular political economy. One of my jobs, after the thinking had been done by the gentleman in front, was to actually keep on going back and talk to the ministers in the countries and actually try to persuade them that this is actually worth doing. And I do remember, and I let me not name names, not even countries, but the kind of imaginative suggestions that uh, uh, were, were made, where one particular minister who had a responsibility for labor issues in the country proudly said that we loved the ideas, but he then started proudly telling the story that it is the, that very morning had managed to get uh, the TV crews out where he had noticed that a small grocery shop had been opened by Syrians in his neighborhood, and he proudly closed it in front of the cameras to saying, surely we can only have proper formal legalized uh, with every 55 license that these people should be having, and actually was destroying jobs in, in front of us. Or another one who gave an actually more morbid suggestion and said, why don't the donors help us to set up something that clearly is in demand at this very moment while so many people were crossing the Mediterranean? Why don't we start a boat industry in this country? So it lets people that they can build their own boats to come to your countries. So the kind of political climate is, is still extremely hard to do. And instead, in fact, we're still struggling with, and we can't underestimate it. Good ideas that are really good for people, it's not straightforward to sell them. And we need to keep on having the thinking and the thought, too, of how we can do it. Subsequently, though, the ideas already are taking hold in other places. These days, when you go to Lebanon, 
with the new government in place, they actually very much welcome the idea that actually we should try, we should be realistic that the conflict will last for a long time, these people will be there. So why actually not trying to work around economic opportunities in these places? But just replicating industrial zones in Lebanon doesn't make much sense because Lebanon doesn't export much beyond financial services. Um, and um, maybe illegal substances. Um, the, there are not the kind of tradition of actually doing this kind of export-oriented and zone-based things. So how do you adapt it to local circumstances? Actually, within days after the Syria conference, uh, I was asked by the minister to say she loved the ideas that were described, the idea of a compact where we start working together, creating jobs and opportunities for uh, and paying for these opportunities in, in countries like Lebanon and Jordan. Why don't you go and check where in other places where there's protracted crisis we can do it? So I ended up on a plane uh, within a week after the Syria conference to Ethiopia and Kenya. And in Kenya, the conversations were very interesting. And indeed, within a week, uh, again, politicians came out again that they would just send everybody back because obviously that's the most sensible solution for any, for any country to do. And we didn't get anywhere. But while in Ethiopia, where they could spot an opportunity and a win-win situation, where they are very keen to build up their industrial zone, industrial parks, where they were willing to actually employ refugees, uh, part or, to, sorry, to, to, uh, if, as, if donors were to be willing to finance an industrial park, they would be willing to allow refugees to work there in large numbers. And indeed, that plan, the industrial park in the north of Ethiopia, ended up being announced by Theresa May at the United Nations General Assembly uh, as indeed her very first policy pronouncement that she made in foreign policy space uh, as, a, as a prime minister. Um, so these things can take hold and we can make progress. So let me wrap up. Is that not trying to say that, uh, that this is impossible to do. We see that these kind of uh, things can work. And that actually, just how important it is that actually thinkers and people interested in public policy try to think through new ideas to, to deal with all challenges. The real problem, as the book describes very well, is that the thinking around refugees has been stale and actually stuck for many decades in a particular model that didn't work for a context where refugees are largely uh, the result of fragility and conflict and therefore are for very long times in, in countries. We need more of this thinking and I can only applaud the book and actually recommend that you should buy it and read it very carefully and be inspired and actually use that kind of thinking to also find other areas and problems to, uh, to get new solutions to old public policy problems. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions now. Um, we have time for questions now. Um, there's a microphone around. Maybe if you could introduce yourself, uh, be aware that wait for the microphone because it's also live stream. So if you could introduce yourself and then uh, uh, um, get a question. Would you like to take a few at, in one go or take one at a time? Probably about three at a time. How three about at a time. Now? Okay, very good. If there's only one question, we'll take one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Pia Jolliffe, um, Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall. My question concerns the protection of um, refugee workers. Um, you don't mention labor union or um, how are these refugee workers, how do you think that their rights are protected and how can they be represented or what kind of representation would they have? Thank you. Um, David Coleman, Department of Social Policy, retired. Um, can I ask about what you think the policy of the um, governments of the rich countries should be in respect of those uh, asylum seekers who make it to those rich countries and who are granted asylum? Um, because you, you mentioned that there was a, a serious problem uh, of, of the draining away of, of highly skilled and highly educated people uh, into the rich countries of the West. Um, when people from anywhere who are granted asylum uh, uh, um, make it, um, the media response, and I think that the general public policy response, is to assume that this is permanent. They are, they are spoken of as though they are now starting a new life. Their old life is over, a new life begins. It is assumed to be permanent. Um, they are assumed to uh, integrate and possibly assimilate um, into the country where they have um, uh, found refuge. 
And this is understandable, um, because in many ways these countries are much, much better, better, safer, richer than the ones they've left. That's why they've come. Um, their children will, will go to school and, uh, and, and become uh, less Syrian and perhaps a little bit British uh, as a consequence. Going home is going to be more difficult, but you were suggesting that, 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 that um, returning home, at least for some, is important, possibly essential, for the rebuilding of these damaged countries. So what should the public policy be of, of the government? Should it be to as it were, ration asylum to see that it should, say that it should be re reviewed every three or four years or something of that kind, which I think may have been uh, something close to the original notion of asylum, that it, that it wasn't necessarily permanent. But what should they do? Okay, thank you. Can you behind you there? Thank you. I'm, I'm Rachel Hinton, and I work um, for the Department for International Development. Um, Alex spoke about the need to restore autonomy and freedoms. Um, and if we speak to refugees themselves, they often um, say that one of the services that they feel is most important for their future um, is actually education. And I'm very interested to hear what lessons um, all three of you might um, provide on how we can do this using some of these more innovative um, political solutions, not just inside refugee camps, but if we are trying to um, give them more autonomy in their wider host community. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll have a little bash at all three of them, and then Paul will probably have things to say on all three of them as well. Um, Pia, I mean, they're, they're all great questions, and they're all quite challenging questions. Pia, the question of labour protections for refugees in the labour market, I think... Um, I think it's impossible to pretend that you're going to overnight get fully unionized, fully protected rights for all refugees engaging in labor markets. But the position we've got at the moment is in most host countries, refugees' options to work are in the informal sector illegally, where they're predominantly unprotected and don't have recourse to government, don't have recourse to police, don't have any effective recourse whatsoever. And I think at least if you begin to formalize some of those labour markets, you give them options for recourse. You allow them to step outside a bubble of exploitation and into a space where they can come forwards if they face threats or challenges. That also means that the protection provided by UNHCR and its implementing partners with responsibility for protection of rights can begin to engage with some of that work insofar as it affects labour rights. It also means that unionisation potentially becomes an option insofar as it's allowed within the legal framework. So I think it, it's not that overnight, by creating, for instance, development areas where there are political constraints, you're going to get perfect labour rights access, but you're going to begin to move from a very suboptimal situation with significant levels of exploitation in the black economy to one where it at least becomes a possibility and institutions, governmental or international, become part of that. You're also going to move to a scenario where, insofar as you have multinational corporation involvement, and a media focus and spotlight on some of these cases, that it becomes massively disadvantageous to you if you're IKEA or ASDA or another multinational corporation to exploit refugees. Um, David, I mean, this is, this is one of the biggest policy challenges. How can Europe address asylum seekers coming to Europe? Um, I think the first thing to say is we need to re-establish trust, public trust, in asylum systems here. And for that to be effective, not everybody who comes to Europe can be judged to be deserving of international protection. If people are not refugees and don't have some other entitlement to claim refuge, we have to have a credible but humane way of returning people. For refugees that come to Europe, of course we should recognize that we have protection obligations towards refugees. And indeed, I think part of what Paul said about comparative advantage is the idea that in the international refugee system, all governments should do a little bit of everything. That governments in the global north should predominantly focus on doing what we have a comparative advantage in. But for symbolic purposes, we should do a bit of everything. So we should be resettling people who have been in limbo for a long period of time. We should be protecting refugees who have to move onwards as a last resort. One of the areas where this becomes murky is how we think about refugees who have already found a safe haven moving onwards as migrants. And I think there's a very strong argument to say that actually the principle of safe third country 
has some ethical validity to it. That if somebody has already found all of the entitlements they should have in seeking safe haven, then actually their onward movement is as a migrant rather than as a refugee. So I think that's, that's how I would begin to think about that. And Rachel, the only thing I'd say on education is that it's an absolutely crucial counterpart to jobs. And some of the data we've gathered in Uganda shows that the returns on education to refugees are not only significant and go up with each stage of education, but our data suggests they may even be higher than the data for returns on education to the national population. They go up from primary to secondary to tertiary quite significantly, and I think it highlights that we are really empowering refugees if we give them access to decent education. And we can share that data with you if it's useful. I'll just add a little bit on education. Um, one of the things that was just mind-blowing in the camps was loads of children um, not in education at all. And alongside loads of Syrian teachers who were unemployed. I mean, this was madness. Right? I mean, actually, coming in as an outsider is kind of what this system needed. It was so mad that any outsider coming in with a fresh eyes would see this is, whatever else you do, this is crazy. And why were the Syrian teachers unemployed and the kids not in school? Because the rules said they are not allowed to work to teach the children. It's the responsibility of the government of Jordan to provide Jordanian teachers. But of course, parents didn't want, because what were the Jordanian teachers going to teach? The Jordanian curriculum. What did parents want? The curriculum that kids had had. You know? So this is such a no-brainer to make things better than that. You know? um, one of the functions of aid should be to pay Syrian teachers to teach the Syrian kids whilst they're not in Syria. You know? I mean, so basic things can be much, much better. Right? Um, return to, to labour rights. Um, go careful here. Right? Go careful. Anybody who's got a work permit has got the same protection rights as any Jordanian. Right? That's, frankly, good enough. We're not trying to make life's refugees better than Jordanians, just bring them into the, you know, a chance of a job. Why I say go careful is um, in talking to the likes of Ikea, the big companies that, of course, there's no problem. If, if, if Ikea creates jobs, they're going to be good jobs. But, but the, one of the, the first impediment that we heard from firms, proper firms, was the biggest risk to us is if some NGO starts to jump up and down and say we're exploiting labour. Right? And that's why they're scared. Their biggest asset, firms like IKEA, is their reputation with consumers. And if there's going to be NGO voices bouncing up and down, shouting exploitation, shame, shocking, they're just not going to go. And if they don't go, people will be stuck in the grimmest conditions at the bottom of the illegal labour market. Right? That's the responsibility for people like you to make sure that you don't scare off the good firms. Make it absolutely clear that a firm, a decent firm, coming in to bring jobs to refugees will be celebrated as a hero, not, ex not, not condemned as a, as a bunch of exploitative crooks. Right? That's your responsibility. You can wield that sensibly or foolishly. Now, there was a final question, which was, oh, yeah, and it's, it's, Alex basically answered it, but let me just put a little tweak on it, right, which is that, as Alex said, you, you know, I mean, you can't be in limbo forever. It's actually quite sensible to, uh, at least for some host country, to say um, um, there's actually going to be a cut-off date, um, you know, Seven years, eight years, I don't, I don't know, whatever it is. But um, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the conditions for your return uh, are not there in seven or eight years' time, uh, you can stay. Um, but if the conditions uh, do make it suitable for you to go back um, before then, then you can go back. Right? The advantage of doing that ex ante 
is that everybody then knows where they are. You can then plan. Do I think this conflict's going to end in the next few years? If I do, until I, whilst I think it's likely, I'm going to conduct my life accordingly. Keep my contacts back home. Save my income here so that I can go back and, you know, set up a business, restore my home, whatever, right? And then as it comes up to the time when, oh, God, I'm not going to be able to go back, then you think for the first time, oh, I'd better actually learn the language, start to integrate, and so on. That's, the, that's a sensible thing, and it will be guided by having ex ante some sort of... It's, in, it's completely arbitrary where it'll be, but it's obviously longer than one month and shorter than 50 years, and somewhere in there, there's a sensible cut-off point, and it would be sensible to say it. Question at the back there. Thank you so much. Uh, Bilal Malayev from the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, and from Lebanon. Um, I asked this question to Alex a few weeks ago in a, in a seminar, and I will ask a variant of it. You spoke about um, safe havens in the nearest countries who are often fragile countries, underdeveloped, and unable to support their own citizens. Jordan is slightly a different example in the sense that it's upper middle income, large uh, surface area, can possibly support the Syrian refugees. But taking Lebanon, which is admittedly an outlier in the, so in the sort of uh, refugee hosting countries, a solution of the sort that, that is being implemented in, in Jordan is, in my opinion, inapplicable. So my question is, why do we keep focusing on neighboring countries, the, 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 the very neighboring countries? I understand that the status quo is that most refugees are in these countries, and we also focus on Europe, US, and Canada, and not focus on countries that are less densely populated around the world, and try to think more creatively about special economic zones around the world where we can resettle people in a more efficient way and return them back to Syria or their home community or before the crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, there at the back. Moritz. Uh, Moritz Paul, I'm a student here at the University of Oxford and uh, last summer I had the privilege to work in Jordan on a, a labor market project. Um, I'd like to invite the two of you to think a bit more critically about the work permit system in Jordan that the government of Jordan put in place. Um, offering these 200,000 work permits certainly was a kind act of the government of Jordan, gave them a lot of support by the international community, a lot of money as well. Uh, whether it's feasible to bring 200,000 people into jobs in Jordan when the labor age population is only 200,000 is a bit of a question. Um, what I would like to focus on is that most actors in the private sector in Jordan that you speak to find them to be a big hassle, um, bureaucratically, also cost-wise very difficult to handle. Um, in terms of labor protection and linking to the first question, the work permits usually bind you to one employer in one sector, and it's a very limited set of sectors for an entire year, making you very um, open to uh, exploitation by that employer. Uh, do, does this status actually grant you any protection? It's a permit on paper. And Jordan, neither for its own citizens nor for anyone else, has the, um, the capacities to actually control uh, labor standards in, in any uh, employment situation. So on the other hand, these working permits for the government work as a good system of, of populist news every now and then where they can say we have thrown out a couple of illegal Syrians, we've brought them back to Zatari camp, um, we've banned a couple of people from working illegally, etc. Um, are we not simply granting the government this news machine of, of positive news that they like to have with not much of an actual economic impact? Okay, I th we'll take one more. There, and then we'll come this way. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel with Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Sorry, Rachel with Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, you might just tell me to buy the book and read it, and the answer is in there, and if you do, that's fair enough. But I wanted to know more about, I think Paul said, um, 
that, that companies relocating to Jordan were aware that this would be for a fixed term and that they would later relocate with their workers to, to Syria or return to the, the country of origin. That doesn't sound like that's feasible to me. And then how do you, how do you sell it to them in terms of if it is a fixed term that you're going to be there and have this labour market for 10 years, why would, they, why would they want to do it if it's only a fixed period of time? Okay, why don't you take these three? Um, yeah, so the, the first one, really good one, really good one, right, that um, um, there are undoubtedly countries that um, where these sort of win-win deals could be formulated, um, which would be good for the country uh, and provide a safe haven for refugees, undoubtedly. Right? Um, and uh, there are also um, places in the neighbourhood that should have taken a lot more refugees. I mean, look at the Gulf states. Where were they missing in action, you know? Um, come to that, where was Israel missing in action? It was the neighbouring state actually occupying some Syrian territory. It could have had a big win by providing safe haven for Syrian refugees in Syrian territory, right? And it didn't. Um, so um, there, we're quite, you're quite right to look at the opportunities in the broader regions and think what could sensibly be done if you got the combination of international money, international trade policy to give good market access as a reward, and uh, international business. I mean, if there's one message from refuge, is that international business has to take the refugee issue out of corporate social responsibility, where they send a load of blankets to a camp, into the boardroom, where they actually do their core job of thinking, can we actually create enterprise in these places that would actually bring international opportunity to the refugees who most need it. Right? Um, the, uh, I'm going to leave Jordan labour market to uh, Alex and it was, just remind me what the third one was, I'll be in it. Oh. Well, the firms only come to for 10 years. Oh yes, I'm sorry. So the, um, uh, is, is the model that firms only go temporarily and then move on? No, um, not at all. Um, but that's not how international business needs to work. That uh, if international business, say, comes to Jordan, comes to zones in Jordan, sets up business, and that business is, is viable, it will stay there. Yeah? But if a chunk of their workers then go back to Syria, it's also entirely feasible to say, we'll set up an operation in Syria. The biggest single um, impediment to setting up a new enterprise in a poor country is, do you have a trained labor force? And if you've got your own trained labor force, it's very much less scary. All the rest is sort of tick box, you know. Have we got government permissions? Is there electricity? Tick, tick, tick. But the, the big unknown is usually, can we get a trained labor force? And that you've secured because you've got a load of Syrian refugees who want to go back. So you can do both. You stay and you move. So on the, looking at the Jordan Compact critically, I mean, I think, yes, absolutely. What we're not doing in the book is making a big argument where we're singing from the roof saying the Jordan Compact has been an absolute success. What we're doing is we're saying we were part of brainstorming some ideas in order to say that for different contexts there are different ways in which creating development opportunities and work opportunities for refugees will work and some of them are more constrained than others. What separately from the book I'm exploring is whether we can do an impact evaluation on the Jordan Compact, not just around the impact on refugees and hosts, but on some of the political economy questions around it. Because as Steph highlighted, it's challenging. Getting investment is challenging. Um, dealing with 
host governments, not just in Jordan, but around the world, involves a lot of messy politics, gatekeepers, vested interests, etc. Um, the nature of engaging with refugee hosting countries is you engage with some fairly complex politics. So I think you're absolutely right, there's a need for criticality, and from a research perspective, that research needs to be done, and we hope to do that. Um, I think, though, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should, as academics and researchers, and in Steph's case, policymakers, shy away from trying to bring improvements, shy away from thinking innovatively and engaging those governments in trying to make a difference. I think 38,000 work permits and moving towards 50,000 is a pretty good starting point. I think, yes, of course, a government in a very constrained position is going to try and represent itself in the best light, and in some cases that's going to be potentially misrepresentative and exaggerative, or potentially used to legitimate. But that, that is, unfortunately, the nature of how politics in most of these countries work. As I recall, our last chapter is History the Remake, which, is, incidentally, it's a good read. We wrote this for you. It's, it's a readable book. Um, but uh, his, in History the Remake, we say, suppose these ideas had already been normal when the Syria crisis started, right? And that's really the, the question. If these, if these ideas had been normal, the institutions had already adapted to doing them, then actually all this would have been very, very much more doable. You know, we are starting from a position where we're just a couple of academics with an idea, and most academic ideas uh, either take a century or eternity for anything to happen at all, right? Um, and in two years, this has actually moved from two wacky guys with an idea to things happening, both in, not just in Jordan, but in Ethiopia, you know, things happening in the World Bank's board, things happening with the European Commission trade policy, right? Now, that's not because we've been ingenious in pushing it, it's because the ideas are actually pretty sensible. They're pretty obvious. As I said, a fresh pair of eyes, two fresh pairs of eyes, just looking at this, it was obvious that things were wrong. Right? And so, yes, we've, it's been an uphill struggle, but just cast your mind into that idea. Suppose this had already been regular currency. No, and, and I, I would like to add there is actually, um, I mean, Maurice, you make a very good point that, you know, it is a, it's quite a jump from wanting to create economic opportunities to actually zooming in on language on permits. And we know that. I mean, as Alex is suggesting, and in fact, his impact evaluation, I can imagine of some of the things that will come out, which is, you know, there's an element within the political economy where it needs to be presented as if, you know, the, the country is still in charge. It is, it is granting that permit, that permission to people to do it. And as a result, we also know that these numbers, they sound very high, but in the early stages, they were easy to reach because that was actually just forcing some informal sector workers to formalize. This was not about new jobs. And we know quite a lot of the early ones. That's why the 200,000 is actually quite achievable because there's, of course, many more Syrians already for long generations in, uh, in uh, or at least uh, temporary or permanently in Jordan and so on that we can have. But it helps in the beginning because we also know the other side, you know. Um, this is at the moment exemplified and it would be brilliant if different people can start evaluating independently. But, you know, I've, I've seen a Syrian firm that exactly did what you described, that actually did on the back of this whole thing and it have relocated in the country and employing uh, something like 70, 80 Syrian workers yeah. uh, and actually doing exactly with almost literally the narrative uh, that, that is being described. Now, I don't know whether that's one out of 100 or one out of two or one out of 3,000. That's what evaluations will do. But, but we shouldn't be too hung up that it's saying, oh, well, uh, that's not, 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 not enough as a number. It is actually this beginning of, of, this, of, of showing that this can work. And most importantly, within these countries, 
these kind of things are actually done generally well received. And within the political economy, people actually say, well, it's actually it's not too bad that actually opportunities are being created, that these firms are being set up and Syrians are being employed. Actually, if anything, it seems quite all right. The country is not collapsing from doing this. And so we can see that it's beginning to work. But let's, let's hope we have good research and, and remain skeptical. And I hope you do it yourself as well, Morris, at some point, doing the research in trying to look at it very carefully and, and, and critically. But it is interesting and it's worth pursuing. It's, you know, two wacky, two wacky guys, as they say, call themselves clearly, uh, getting some ideas and actually trying to see with various people getting involved, trying to put it in practice. I think that's, that's what good public policy making and thinking around it should be about. Um, Let's do one more round and then we'll close, I think. Not, not more? Quick, one, one, one more question. One, one very more short question. question. <laughs> I know there was a few on this side, so I'll take these two and then we'll close, okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm Lena from the Refugee Studies Center and I just have two brief questions, um, both practical and normative, I think. The first one is about the allocation of responsibility. Um, Last week at the conference we had Alenikov said that you can't get out of the box if you don't see the box, and in this case states are the box. Um, so if we actually look at other actors, for example the private sector, that might be both more willing and more capable to provide solutions, how can we actually allocate the accountability for doing that towards these actors? Um, and the other, questions that, other question that's related to that is um, how does your idea tie back to the three durable solutions that we have? Because if we grant labor market rights to refugees, um, what is kind of the longevity of this prospect and how does it link back to, to local integration? Um, and so the last question I have is, um, we've, in your presentation you've, you've spoken mostly about the duty of the rich states, providing money, providing jobs. But in the discussion, I think we focused mo mostly on the duty of refugees uh, and where they can go and how long they can stay. So how can we delineate the duties of refugees in, in the broken system? Okay. And Neil, only one question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Neil McCulloch. Uh, and with the policy practice, which is a political economy consultancy. Um, I, I really, I, first of all, I very much welcome this thinking. I think it's a fantastic uh, and a very obvious idea. It's great from a humanitarian point of view to give people autonomy, and it's a no-brainer as an economist uh, to pursue this path. But precisely as Stefan's comments made clear, the challenges are all with the political economy. If I was a politician, in one of the host countries and someone said, please will you give work permits to a sizable chunk of the population, I would be extremely nervous about doing that for all of the reasons that we've seen in the debate about EU migration within the UK, which is a, as a proportion is far, far, far tinier and which of course has no evidence whatsoever has any negative impacts, but one can understand the concerns of politicians in host countries when the, the sizes of migration flows and refugee flows are so much larger. So my question is simply this. This. What can we do in addition to supplying jobs and investment to help the domestic politicians deal with the political problems that they face in getting policies like this accepted? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll you do the first one. Yeah, okay. Um, you might also want to weigh in on the first question because Lena's a student at the Refugee Studies Centre and has sort of heard from me more than she probably needs to. So you might want to pick up some of it, but I'll give it a go. Um, accountability. Um, I mean, I think. Firms have sources of accountability. They have accountability to their shareholders. They have accountability to their consumers. But I think also in this sort of zeitgeist of saying the firm is a new actor, it's worth not forgetting that the state still matters. And the state, I think, is still the central actor. So I was there for Alex Alenikov's comments. I, I don't entirely accept that we can sort of cast aside states in reimagining the refugee system, at least not in the short term. I think state regulation creates the environment within which business functions. And that's not just domestically, but it also has some degrees of transnational reach over where and how firms operate. So I, I, I'd say whether we like the box or not, your box is still there and is actually one of the best routes we have towards accountability, although not the exclusive route. Durable solutions. I mean, I think that the key contribution we're making to the, the thinking about the traditional durable solutions of um, repatriation, local integration, resettlement, is to say return is still 
the ideal solution. And it's the ideal solution because it allows people to go back and ultimately rebuild their countries and their societies. But it requires that we nurture those skills and talents and abilities while they're in exile to allow them to go back. But we're also recognising that we can't leave people waiting for Godot and in limbo indefinitely, that the cut-off that Paul suggested can often concentrate minds. And if at the point that people can't go back, there's a need for an alternative, we collectively need to find that. Now, in some cases, you might get a host state popping up and saying, actually, we're really benefiting. Let's carry on with this for a certain proportion of the population and get local integration. But we also recognize that resettlement becomes a crucial part. But let's resettle in a strategic, thought-through and collective way, rather than it just being something, which I think it is at part of the moment, that it appeases our conscience by taking a handful of vulnerable people, but does nothing to structurally change these situations. And we've got a part of the book where we talk a little bit about the duties of refugees, because it's, it's a fairly unexplored area. And I don't think we discuss them in particularly onerous ways, but actually the, the obligations that refugees have in part to their own societies, that if you happen to be a very educated Syrian, your life may be dramatically improved if you can migrate to Germany. But if a huge proportion of the degree-educated workforce moves to Europe and assimilates and never goes back, where will that ultimately leave the Syrian economy? And so that's not an absolute obligation, but it's one that needs to be balanced. So we're saying we don't expect you to wait around in Jordan for 10, 15 years, but actually if there is a chance to go back, well, actually one of the obligations you might have is to consider your society and its future trajectory before you exclusively think about your own uh, long term. Um, the, um, let me focus on the, the political economy question. And the, 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 there's two parts to the answer, really. One is the guy back there, that, that it doesn't have to work everywhere. Okay? Safe haven is satisfied when there's one decent safe haven right? um, for a refugee. So, so it doesn't have to work everywhere. It has to work somewhere. Right? It has to work in enough places that there's a credible set of locations for refugees. And so we're looking for places where the combination of jobs and money and prestige and recognition and showcasing, uh, you know, that this is a package um, that actually uh, attracts attention. Um, I, in a completely different context, I've been working very closely with the German government the last few months uh, for their G20, where we've got um, an initiative on Africa. It's called the Compact with Africa. And um, that's, a, that's a package of choice where African governments can choose to make obligations and if they choose that, then G20 governments were saying, well, you should make matching obligations around the broad theme of private investment and infrastructure improvement. Uh, we've just launched it, um, and there are already seven African countries leapt up and said, well, we want that. There'll, there'll be a lot more by the time we've finished. Um, so this, this appetite out there, there's countries that are very worried, their governments are very worried that they're stuck in poverty and they want to do something which gives them a lift out. And if, if refugees are an opportunity to get a lift out, some countries will take it, not all. Can I just add something in parentheses to Neil's question? I mean, I think this is also something the international institutions are missing. Very localized political economy analysis and the capacity to do the political analysis to know where the constraints are in the host states and societies. And so, again, this is a message that that we have for organizations like the UN Refugee Agency, build in the capacity for political analysis so that you at least know what those constraints are and you're not naive about them. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for, to all of you for your, your questions and your patience as well. Um, and maybe we should also thank the two uh, main speakers here for, uh, for their contribution. And good luck with the book, I would say. <laughs> thank you. Here's the deal. You read it and spread the ideas. We'll sign it now. <laughs>